Father, we thank you. It's so good to be in your presence this evening in the wonderful city of London. Lord, I thank you by your spirit you are present here today. Therefore, Lord, I ask you, move up and down every row, move up and down every aisle, touch every life and prepare every heart. For, Lord, we know it is the entrance of your word today that will bring light and it will bring life. And, Lord, I thank you for both that will illuminate and will explode in your house this evening. Lord, I thank you that I'm anointed this day not only to preach and teach your word with simplicity and understanding, but every single person within this room and within the sound of my voice is equally anointed, not only to hear your word, but to do your word. And not only to do your word, but to see the effects and the fruits of your word come to pass in their lives. We thank you, Lord, that your word, your wisdom, it is the main thing. Therefore, Lord, this evening, we choose to get your word. We choose to get your wisdom. And in all that we are getting, we get understanding. And all God's people set. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm really looking forward to this session because um, if I'm being honest, and it's always good for your pastor to be honest. Not that I'm your pastor, you understand, but you, you understand what I'm saying. I'm really looking forward for this because I believe the Lord, as soon as I realized I was coming down today to take, to take this day, before, before the Lord even, you know, before I had that witness in my spirit about what we were going to look at in the morning, immediately the Lord said to me, this is what you are to teach on Sunday nights. And I know that, I know Dr. Mumba's taught as well, and wherever I go, I just, listen, I, there's, a, there's a saying that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I see what my man of God's doing. I see that that thing works. And so I just do the same. So in Bradford, whenever we, on a Sunday morning, we preach. And on a Wednesday night, we study. And on a Sunday night, we get into some real life issues. And today, it's going to be no different. Tonight, I'm going to get into some real life issues. It may get quiet in the house today. But you know and I know. I think Dr. Mumba put it this way. You throw an old shoe into a pack of dogs. And the one that hollers is the one that got hit. Yeah. But if we all kind of sit there, we'll know that no, nobody else will know that actually the Lord by his spirit has just got you. And so I'm looking forward to this. My prayer is this, that your investment of time in this session will be worth your while. Can you say amen? Yeah. And so I want to talk to you this evening about something that is not often talked about in church. I want to talk to you about something that is may be seen by some as being a bit controversial or a bit, no, 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 Mark, we don't go there. But praise God, you know in El Shaddai, there are no, no go areas. If you've sat under Dr. Mumba's ministry for long enough, you'll know that no stone is left unturned. Even the unspeakable is spoken about. I've listened to him speak sometimes. I'm thinking, no, leave me alone. But every time, that word that always corrects, it always builds and restores. And tonight I want to talk to you about how to deal with temptation. I think I scared some people off this morning. But praise God, you and I are going to get some understanding tonight. How to deal with temptation. I don't know about you, but I'm fully aware of the fact that one day, never mind everybody else, one day I will stand before God. One day, Mark Pease will stand before the judge and the maker of the heavens and the earth. And I will give an account for every word that I've spoken, every thought that I've had, every idle word, every profound word. <laughs> I will have to give an account for everything. And sometimes I, I don't think many Christians actually understand that that is a reality. One day, you will also stand before God. And you will give an account for the life that you have lived and I'm sure you're like me. I want to I wanna be at the point where I make sure that I, I give God the best that I can while I'm on this earth. And I want to make sure that I become everything that he wanted me to become. And so I'm on a mission, if you like, not to, not to leave any stone unturned, not to, not to brush some things aside. My prayer is, Lord, whatever needs to change, change. The words I live my life for are these words. When I stand before him, I want to hear the words. Mark, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, I want to talk to you about this area, which I understand is possibly a prickly area. But I understand also that whatever you don't deal with in life will deal with you. And you know, Christians, particularly in churches like ours, you know, the charismatic kind of churches, you know, we're, we're good at, open displays of spirituality. 
you know, many like to prophesy and, and, and some prophesy. And, and you know, we, we, we're good at some of these outward gestures. But also, you and I are living a real life on a real earth, given to us by a real God. And you and I have to make sure we make a real good job of what he has given us. And so, I'm conscious that my life is essentially an offering to him that I don't want, I don't want to shortchange God. And in this whole area to do with temptations, you get a whole lot of people at different points or different stages. You'll get some who'll make it look like they're never tempted by anything or anyone. We'll deal with you tonight. And you get others who make it look like they've graduated from every temptation known to man. Don't worry, we'll deal with you tonight. And while they make it look like they've graduated, they'll spend all their time looking down at others. And yes, the issues may be different, but you and I know everyone is working through some things. And so, we need to understand how to deal with temptation. Why? Because, you know, I sit down with people all the time and one of the things that breaks my heart the most as a pastor is when you sit down with, I don't want to say old people, because I believe we are all young this evening. Oh, I'm underwhelmed by that response. You know, it's just that some of us are less young than others. But sometimes it's when you sit down with people and you talk with them and you get to the root of some issues and you realise that what some people are struggling with in their 50s, 60s and 70s are things that they never dealt with in their teens and their 20s and their 30s. And every time I come from a session like that, I say, Lord, please, I refuse for that to be me. And as I said, whatever you don't deal with in life, it will deal with you. But praise God, tonight we're going to deal with some things. The book of Matthew, chapter 4. Let's get into this this evening. And while you're turning there, I just want you to make a mental note of Mark chapter 4, which is the parable of the sower. And because of time, we don't, we don't have time to go there. But that parable, one of the things it, it teaches and, and says to us is this, that if you don't deal with temptation, it can choke the word. It can limit your destiny. It can, those things that you were believing God for, if you refuse, continually refuse to deal with temptation so that you get above and beyond those things, those things can, can become such a hindrance to you in your walk with God. And so... That's just a mental note there. But I want to start in Matthew chapter 4. Are you there? Have a look at your neighbour's Bible and make sure that they're there. You know, they might be somewhere else. No, I believe all of us this evening, we can find Matthew. And Matthew chapter 4 says this in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. I bet he was. Now when the tempter came to him, he said... If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Man, that must have been a biggie right there. Do you know how nice bread smells when it's just been baked? You know, there's something about bread just coming straight from the oven. Never mind when you've not eaten for 40 days. Never when you're full and you've not eaten for 40 minutes. Maybe when you've spent all afternoon eating pumpkin cake. There's something about fresh bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the devil took him up into a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and, and this was written, he shall give you angels, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came 
and ministered to him. The first thing I want you and I to understand this evening is this. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the one whom you and I worship. Jesus, who at this moment in time is sat at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus, the one we lift our hands to and the one who we fall upon our knees towards. That very same Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted. And it had to be tempted. For it to be temptation, it had to appeal to him. Can you imagine how that bread would have appealed to him? Can you imagine just in the flesh for that moment, the thought of having all the kingdoms handed back to him? For it to be temptation, it had to appeal to him. So, you and I cannot be tempted by something or someone who does not appeal to you. Uh huh. It has to appeal to you. Otherwise, by definition, it is not tempted. For example, you could make the nicest salad. You could dress that thing up and drizzle it with all these drizzles, I don't know what they call, olive oil and vinaigrettes and, and you could even cut your tomatoes into flashy star shapes and you could, you could do something fancy with your lettuce and you could, you could even get obscure salad that nobody's heard of and you could present it on, a, on the finest platter and you could serve it to me and I would not be tempted. Why? Because I eat salad out of necessity, not out of pleasure. You couldn't, if I was fasting, you could bring all, you could, you bring all the salad. It would not tempt me. However, if you bring big juicy steak, Aberdeen Angus cut to medium rare, so it's just so pink and, 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 oh, should we just all close the meeting and go to a restaurant right now? <laughs> now that, for me, would be temptation. You can only be tempted by something or someone that appeals to you. If they don't appeal to you, you can call it what it is, but it is not temptation. And so Jesus, the Son of God, he was tempted. So when you and I are tempted, because we're going to find out this evening, I don't care how holy you look at me, every single one of us in this room is tempted by something. Well, it's different for Jesus, you might be saying. He's not going through what I'm going through. <laughs> He's not having to face what I'm having to go through. Jesus didn't have to put up with the internet. <laughs> Jesus, you know, Jesus never had it like that. Jesus was only tempted three times. And you know, sometimes you can feel no matter where you look, you feel that there's temptation on every side. It was all right for Jesus. No, you'll find out if you study your scripture, all of those three temptations that Jesus was, was tempted in, Whatever your or my temptation is, you will find that all of our temptations will fall under one of those three things. That's a class for another time. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, however old you are, however young you are, just as Jesus was tempted, you and I can sometimes be tempted. As I've said, well, it's different for Jesus. No, you might be saying, Jesus, he was fully God. As if that was some kind of magic card that he could play. Not that we believe in magic. Jesus had some real temptations. You know, the scripture says he was tempted and tested at all points. And yet, and this is the beauty of it, somehow he was without sin. And that's the aim and that's the area. That's where you and I, we are striving to get through. But what I want you to know is this, Jesus was tempted. And if Jesus was tempted, trying to catch as many eyeballs as I can, 
What makes you and I think that we are immune from it? Jesus was tempted. You and I are living a life where every so often temptations come. And so we need to know, how do we deal with those temptations? You know, you only have to look around at society. You only have to look around at celebrities. You only have to look around in the kingdom of God. And, and you'll, see, you'll, see, you'll see examples of people failing this trap left, right and centre. And you know, people are quick to judge. People are quick to offer commentaries. Where you, you want to know the only people you and I are qualified to judge is ourselves. And if only we would concentrate on becoming the best you and I that we can be, rather than looking at the splinter in somebody else's eye and ignoring the huge log in our own eyes. I'm glad I came this evening. And so you and I need to know how to deal with these things. I wonder, and don't worry, we're not going to do this, but one of the things I love about coming down here is you have these two big screens up here. And I wonder, that's not the best of shots, I'll turn around. And I wonder if we were able to, in a big brother style, project from these cameras onto these screens. See, some of you already know what I'm going to say. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it. But I wonder if we could project your last seven days, every thought... Now, don't give yourself away now. <laughs> every thought, every word, every action, including your actions in church and your actions when you're with your friends who maybe don't even know you're a Christian. I told you we're going to talk about some things tonight. I wonder whether before they press play, you'll be running for the doors. Run, Forrest, run! But the fact is, you and I live in a, in, a, in, a, in a life and in a place where temptation is all around. Remember what I said, what you don't deal with will deal with you. What I also want you to know is this, being tempted is not wrong. And all the real folks say, yeah. you know, there are some temptations you can't do... You, you never meant to put yourself there just by being your own wonderful self. And now, you, have you noticed now how the weather's getting nicer? Sometimes you can just be walking down Golders Green High Street or whatever they do. They, they're not whatever, whatever they call that road out there. You could just be walking around, having a walk around the park, and the sun is shining. You're walking around and you're praying in the Holy Ghost. You're having a great time, and suddenly walking down the other way comes. I don't know, brother Smooth. And he's so smooth that his jeans are halfway down his backside. Oh, I, I hate that. What makes anyone think that we want to see their pants? Put your pants away. But suddenly minding your own business and suddenly an opportunity is there. Or walking down the park and suddenly from nowhere... It appears like the glory of the Lord is coming your way, but it's Sister Curvy. You didn't go looking. It's all right if we can talk like this. You didn't even go looking for her, but just by living life, you're confronted with her, and now you've got a choice to make. Martin Luther said this, being tempted is like this. It's having a bird fly over your head. You can't prevent some birds from flying over your head. But what you can do is prevent the bird from landing on your head. Building a nest, or in other words, making a home. So that suddenly the thing that is the issue for you, you just turn that over again and again. You better be careful now because the scripture says, as you think in your heart, so are you. And what you think in your heart is what you really, really and so we need to know how to deal with these things. But being tempted is not wrong. But you've got to understand that the devil will go for your point of weakness. Everybody in this room 
has a potential area that is weaker than others. Now, you look around, everybody just take a moment, look around this room, everybody have a look around at everybody, don't be looking at them as if to say, I wonder what your issue is. <laughs> One of the things I love about this, this ministry is this, you look around, we come in all different shapes and sizes, we all look different, that, wouldn't it be horrible if everybody looked like you, or me, if everybody sounded like you or sounded like me, this thing would be so boring. But praise God, we, we come in all different shapes and sizes and shades of the spectrum and I love all that. But having said all that and celebrating all of our differences, there are things going on right now in our lives for some of you that you think you're the only one. But if you were to really know what's going, in, going on for that person on your left or on your right, you'd be surprised that maybe they're going through the same thing as you. Say to your neighbour, oi. oi. <laughs> Come on, tell them, oi. oi. What's your issue? No, don't tell them. Don't, don't tell them. Don't tell them until you can guarantee the person you're sat next to because sometimes you'll tell somebody something and before the day's out, your business is all over Facebook. First Corinthians chapter 10. So Jesus was tempted. So if Jesus was tempted, I dare say you and I will have our moments. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says this. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. You want to know the most dangerous position to be in is the position of thinking you've got it all together. Those things that used to be an issue, you've got them licked. Those things that used to be your stumbling block, you've got them licked. Those things, you're walking around letting everybody know that you've graduated from that class. That is a dangerous position to be in because what you stop paying attention to, if you're not careful, will turn around and bite you on the bum. There's a saying in sports, you probably guessed by now, I love my sport. When you play football, they say if your team scores a goal, you are at your, so you, you know, you've succeeded, you've gone ahead, you are at your most vulnerable when you've scored. Why? Because you think you're en route to winning the game. And it's amazing how many teams concede after, after they've just done something great. And it's the same for you and I. So the scripture says, take heed unless you think you've learned all your lessons. Take heed unless you fall. And then he says this in verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. Everything that you're going through, those areas of difficulty, regardless of whoever knows or whoever doesn't know, regardless of if you feel you're the only one, isn't that amazing how sometimes you can feel like you're the only one? I remember going to church one time, back in the early days when I was part of another church, way back as a teenager. One of my biggest struggles was this. Is it, can I just, I just, oh, whatever. One of my biggest struggles was this. You know, you'd be going through life and you'd be going through your challenges as a teenager. And I'd go to church and I'd look around. And everybody looked so perfect. Everybody looked like they got it all together. All the married folk looked like they never rowed. All the kids were so well behaved. I later found out that they were essentially bullied or drugged. <laughs> Not really drugged, you understand that. <laughs> and I'm looking around thinking, I'm going through X, Y and Z. And I want somebody to talk to. But everywhere I looked, I thought, well, I don't want to tell them. Because everywhere I looked, it looked as if everybody had graduated from the things that I could not graduate from at the time. So I felt like the only one. I felt like the only Jew in Jerusalem. I felt like the only Nigerian in Lagos. <laughs> I felt like I felt like the only cockney in London in it and all all I wanted at that time 
was just somebody trustworthy who I could say, look, bro, this is how it is for me. Will you be my brother's keeper? And so he said, nothing has overtaken you except that which is common to man. Whatever you're going through, I want to tell you this. It's not uncommon. It is common to man. You might feel like you're the only one. It's not uncommon. It is common to man. You might feel like you're the only one in this room, but if I could rip people's heads open and have a look in, and you know, if we turned everybody upside down and shut them out and we saw what came out, you would be surprised at how many things which were similar to what you felt you were the only one going through would come out of other people. And yet here we all are at church with our charismatic smiles. How are you doing, brother? I'm too blessed to be cursed, comes a reply. And so he says, nothing has overtaken you, which is common to man. And then he says this, but God is faithful. Thank God. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to take. The first thing you've got to understand is this. When you're going through temptation, you've got to be able to factor this in. God would not allow you to go through it. Now everybody say balance. I'm not saying that the temptation came from God. No, because that that is not scripture. But there is something about God's goodness that if, if... Perchance you are going through something, God would make it impossible for you to go through it unless he knew that you had it in you to overcome it. Every time that thing comes your way, if it's the opposite sex, for some of you if it's the same sex, work that one out. If it's for some of you, ice cream. Or chocolates. Or Snickers. Or if it's for some of you, that, that longing just to, just to, while nobody's looking, or for some of you while everybody's looking, just to run your mouth off and give somebody a piece of your mind. Because they just make you so mad. Can't believe they did that. Who do they think they are? Disrespecting me. What is it with people and disrespect? How about applying the principles of sowing and reaping? How about sowing some respect? You might find you should reap some respect. Somebody start the car. And so... God's already decided, whatever it is you're facing, you can make it. The first thing you should say to yourself, when whatever it is for you, you should get a hold of yourself and say, I'm about to go through this again, but thank God he would not allow me to go through it. That means I can beat it. And then he says this, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to take. But look at this, but with the temptation... He will also provide, or he will also make the way of escape. That you will be able to bear it. Notice, he won't let you go through anything that you can't handle. And because he's so good, he's also made sure that there is a door with the word exit on. And all you have to do is find the door. Now we read with Jesus. We know what the door is. The door is, it is written. Whenever you, now, you, you better find out what your scripture is for you with your particular thing. But the door is, it is written. That's why you've got to know your scripture. That's why you've got to know your word, particularly to the issue that you're dealing with. It is written. That is the door of escape. The door of escape is not this. Looking once. Looking twice. And then saying, ooh, yeah. That is not a door of escape. And so God in his goodness will make sure that you can handle it 
and number two, he will make sure that there is a door of escape. The only thing you have to do is find the way out. Now, having said that, having said that, I want to talk to you a little bit about how practically you and I, we can overcome temptation when it comes your way. Because, you know, the book of Jude, we won't go, there's still something amazing. He says, to him who is able to keep you from falling. Did you know it is possible to live a sin-free life? Isn't that amazing? Are we there yet? No. However, I also believe that we are a work in progress. But the scripture says it is possible. There is a level that you can get to in your walk with God where you're so at one with him that it's as if you merge into him and he merges into you and he's able to keep you from stumbling. That's where we're going. But until we get to that point, we need to know, okay, when temptation comes, what is it that I can do? I'm going to give you five things quickly. Number one. First thing that you can do is this. Recognize that we all have issues. This is very important. Number one, recognize that you, just like your neighbor, has issues. You've got to recognize that. The worst place you can be in as a Christian is, is in that place of denial. Like Sarah, you know, after the Lord spoke to her about having a child and she laughed within her heart and the Lord said, I heard you laugh and she said, I didn't laugh. She's in denial. Some of you are in denial about your areas of weakness. you got roaming eyes. And you thank the Lord when summer comes because you can wear those sunglasses that are shaded on the outside. You know, reflect it. No, I haven't got an issue, but inward, you know and God knows that your eyes are going all over the place. But you're in denial. You know, maybe you're overeating. And you think, no, I'm not overeating. I bind, you can, listen, you can bind things as much as you want. Some of you, I bind, I bind Ben. And I bind Jerry. And you can even make a vow and consecrate yourself before the Lord that when you go shopping, you will not go down the ice cream aisle. But there's something about the ice cream aisle that when you get there, it's as if there's no other aisles in the shop and all the aisles lead to Ben and all the other aisles lead to Jerry and when you get there, it's like a parting of the Red Sea and all you see is ice cream. (laughs) But somebody says, I think you're eating too much ice cream. And you know you're eating too much ice cream. And they know you're eating too much ice cream. Your trousers know you're eating too much ice cream. But oh no. And because you know, and they know, and God knows, and everybody knows, we go on the offensive. And we start looking for things in their life. And we start, look, okay, what's not quite working out with you? Listen, forget what's not working out with them. They just got you. Say to your neighbor, oi, Oi. put the ice cream back. back. Turn to the other side and say, I'm watching you. you. The biggest problem, (laughs) the biggest problem that you have in life, you've heard Dr. Mumba say this many times. The biggest problem in life that you have is the one that you don't think that you have. That's profound. Thank God for a profound man of God. You're not the odd one out. Admitting that there are some things to work through is the first place that you have to be at. Why? Because if you don't admit that, you can't build upon anything else. You ha- now, you have to be, we're going to look at that. You have to be careful who you talk to. But the first thing you have to do is to, to, is to admit to yourself Mark, I've got to tighten up in this area. And you've got to make, the, the moment that you do that, you are in the, t- you're at the perfect place to be able to get to work. So ask your neighbour, are you in denial? 
you know, look at them, look at them like there was this old prophet, old prophet, old man of God when I was growing up, and I used to think, don't look at me, don't look at me, because it was every time he looked at me, it was as if my life, however much I tried to hide it, was an open book, and he would talk to me, and he'd be looking at me, and we'd be having a conversation, I'm thinking, don't read my mind! So the first thing, dealing with temptation, is this, number one. You've got to recognise that we all have issues. Thank God that God loves us regardless of our issues. Can you say amen? amen. Number two. After you recognise that there are some issues to work with, number two is this. Seek accountability. If only Christians would do this. And I understand why many Christians don't do this, because they don't feel safe. But if only we could become that company where people felt safe in one another's company. The book of James, just after the book of Hebrews. Is this helping anybody today? The book of James. The book of James. Chapter 5. Let's see this in the Word. Remember we're talking about how to deal with temptation. Number two is this. Seek accountability. James chapter 5 and verse 16 says this. Confess your trespasses to one another and gossip about one another on Facebook. Sorry, let me try and read that again. Confess your trespasses to one another and say just enough on Facebook that you put enough doubt in somebody's mind but you can't be held accountable for anything. Does it say that? No, the scripture says confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. That you may be healed. Notice the whole point is restoration. What is it about church folk who when they hear about a weakness with somebody else, they suddenly feel better about themselves? No, if you're really a Christian, love covers. If you're really a Christian, you will be seeking your brothers and sisters' restoration and you will be seeking their highest good if you are really who you say you are. You will be saying, how can I help you and not let anybody else know? Amen. And so, every single one of us needs friends like that. Somebody who is safe. Somebody who you can go and talk to. I thank God that I've got that in my life. Somebody who you can go and talk to and you could say anything. You could just, you could just open yourself and, 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 and cut your heart in half and, and just tell them everything. And you know that what you talk about stays in the room. And you know that after you've spoken, the way they think about you has not changed. And you know that despite all of that mess, they have your greatest good at heart. And you know, rather than judging you, you know that they'll be there in the trenches with you saying, how can we beat this thing? You and I, we need friends like that. The question is, do you have them? I'm glad some of you do. Got to be careful though, who you let in. Oh, I've learned this in life, I've learned this. Oh man, I learned this the hard way. There's some people you'll tell everything to. Just because for the last few weeks or a few months, you know, it's been going good. And suddenly, you know, you don't really know who your friends are. Until you're faced with a disagreement or a... Or a, or a difficulty or a challenge and you can express a difference of opinion but when, it, but when you get that's, that's when you know who your friends are and yet Christians are just happy to there's a term in military warfare called friendly fire friendly fire is rife in the church Christians judging other Christians and yet not one of us is qualified to judge in fact you and I we were all judged and you want to know what the verdict was? guilty thank God for Jesus my issue might not be somebody else's issue your issue might not be somebody else's issue but I'll tell you something there are a whole lot of issues going on 
it's all gone quiet over there. <laughs> yes. So, you need to find somebody who you can be accountable to. It's amazing that what you thought was unbeatable, when you just open yourselves up to one person who will understand and is trustworthy, it's amazing how what seemed impossible now seems possible. I'm telling you what I know. It's amazing. You just talk to them about that issue. You know, every so often, uh, now this is an example, this is not my issue. Amen. But let's just say, every so often, you know, you get a bit stressed and you, you get a little bit on edge and, and you know, you, you, you pray and you do all those things, but there's only one thing that helps you wind down. And it's that little thing maybe that you roll up <laughs> or that bottle that you pop and you open and, you know, grandpa's old cough medicine is a, an ever-present help in time of need. If you're going to confess that kind of thing to one another, Wisdom says, when I open myself up to somebody, I do not want to do it with somebody who has the same area of weakness that I have. You want to know why? Because let's say, you got a, let's say there's an issue with drink, and then you, you look over there and you see somebody else with an issue with drink. So you say, come on, let's tackle this thing together. Now there may be some times where you make some good ground, but there'll be some times where one of you is just picked off. And you just want to drink. And so he says to you, I could murder a drink right now. <laughs> and you were doing well. And you're pressing on and you go, but you hear that? And you think, ooh. <laughs> Did he just say what I thought he said? And before you know it, you're both down at threshers, racking up those loyalty cards. Having fellowship with Brother Jack and his brother Daniels. <laughs> or hanging out with Sister Bacardi because nothing feels like her. Mm. Wisdom says, wisdom says, find somebody who you feel safe with and you know is not struggling in those areas. And let them mentor you. Let them support you. Let them. There are some people in Bradford, I've told them, listen, at any time within 24 hours, you can expect a call from me. I've even told some of them, at any time, if I'm calling by, I'm calling in on you, don't be surprised if I ask to have a look on your computer. Now, I don't do that with everybody. Oh, I always knew how should I was heavy shepherding. No, 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 no. We have an agreement. They've already come to me. But the, I can look around the congregation in Bradford and I've said to some of them, because you know that when the congregations are big, you can't physically get around everybody every week. So I've said to some of them, because they've made themselves accountable to me, I said, if you see me preaching, and if my eyes meet yours, and if my eyes meet yours, I'm not using you as an example. <laughs> but if my eyes meet yours, I want you to know, because this is what I know, I am asking you, even if I'm preaching about the glory... As soon as my eyes hit yours, what I'm saying is, you know that thing we talked about? How are you doing? How are you doing? And there was silence in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, you've got to recognize, I've got some stuff to work with. Number two, you've got to find some accountability. Find somebody. Number three. You've got to be aware of your weak points. You've got to be aware of your weak points. And we all have them. And when you're aware of them, take precautions. Be aware of your weak points. You know, when, when I was at Bradford University, oh, way back, man, it was oh, mid-90s. We went to Bradford University. Dr. Mumba went. We all were kind of roommates in this house in Bradford at Pemberton Drive and we were all there. And one of the things that we love to do, yeah, you might find this difficult to, to understand, and, but one of the things that we love to do was on a Friday night, you know, because sometimes I think Christians are just too deep. One of the things we love to do, Christians, loving God, we just like to go out and party. However, we had a different... Partying to us meant something completely different to partying to the rest of the people at the university. You understand what I'm saying? 
and we, we'd go out and we'd, and we'd think, what is it with these places? You know, all we want to do, we love God, all we want to do is go out, have a good time, we want to dance, we want to do our thing. Why is it that when we're out there, people think that our bodies are their property? <laughs> there you are going to church on the Sunday, thinking about how. Anyway. <laughs> so I remember we were walking all home one night, Hannah was there. We were walking home one night, we're thinking, we just left one time because it was, it was just like people. It, it, sometimes these clubs are nothing more than meat markets. Yes. And you'll never find your affirmation in a meat market. Yes. You'll find people looking for the lowest. I can't say that. So, we walked home one night thinking, what's all this about? And then we made a decision. We were walking and we were talking and we were saying, right, we love to dance. We like to go out and have fun. However, there's something about that when you're out there, you know, it gets past a certain time and it's as if everybody kisses goodbye to their morals. You know, they're under the influence, Brother Jack again. And we're thinking, we don't want to be at that point because we also want to make sure that when we go before the Lord, it's with clean hands and a pure heart. But we like to dance could we do this place where we used to go to it had one of those John Travolta floors you know with all the floors in different colors and you'd kind of step onto one square and the square would light up and then you'd dance in a kind of 70s kind of okay whatever and so we decided this well we don't even want to you know the Bible talks about even fleeing the, even the appearance of evil we came to this decision right if we're going to go, and also we weren't, we weren't those people who thought, right, we're going to go out every night because we also believe in balance. Right. You can't be out every night and do a job well. You can't be out every night and study well. Anyway, that's for another time. And so we made this decision right. There's a certain time that when things get out of hand. And so, because all we wanted to do was dance, we made this commitment with one another. Number one, neither of us would go on our own. Number two, if we're going, we go in a group. Number three, we make sure we leave the place by a particular time. Because all we wanted to do was dance. And so we got there early. You want to know that most of you won't ever want to go anywhere early because you just think, oh, it's so dead. I'd rather it be dead and pure. And all we wanted to do was dance. So we'd get there early. There'd be no one around. People would still be stocking up whatever and we'd be there. There'd be Hannah over one side. There'd be me over the other side, doctor, and we'd be dancing. We had the whole floor to ourselves. Oh, you've never seen so many moves. And then suddenly, sorry Frank and drunk Sue and all these people would suddenly start to come in. And the moment we felt that, no, nah, because you can tell, you can discern sometimes in your spirit that now is a good time to leave. Yeah. We'd walk home. About 10.30 at night. Yeah. We've danced. Yeah. I go to bed, I'm fresh for lectures the next day. I don't have to spend half the night repenting about crazy stuff that I know I shouldn't have done. It was with clean hands. And a pure heart, what am I saying? I'm saying this, be aware of your weak spots. Some of you, if you're out, I don't know why we keep talking about this, but anyway, let's go with it. Some of you need to make a decision. If you have to go to those kind of places, make sure you never go on your own. And if even then you cannot trust yourself. Do you want to know what I counsel some of the ladies in Bradford to do? You know, because sometimes they get to the stage, well, I just couldn't help myself and, and the atmosphere just kind of ran away with me and all of that. You want to, ladies, do you want to know what you can do? Gentlemen, do you want to know what you can do? I'm about to help you. I am about to help you. When you go out, and I apologize if this offends anybody, but I'm telling you, this will help you. When you go out, you make sure, gentlemen, that you are wearing the most embarrassing pair of underwear. Leave your Calvin Kleins at home. And can you remember the little vest and pants that they used to use as a little boy? 
On Monday, it's a train. On Tuesday, it's a car. On Wednesday, it's a bus. And it's got the day written all over. I'm being serious. Ladies, never mind Lacenza, grandma's old knickers will suffice. Ah, uh, what will that do for you? I'll tell you what that will do for you. You'll be thinking there will not be a room dark enough. <sighs> I'm being serious. I am being serious. Back to the notes. I don't know if your issue is the internet. You know, there are packages out there. There are packages out there that you can register for. I don't know, spend 20, 30 quid. And I've got the, I, I have this with some people who've made themselves accountable to me. And they, they put in my email address. And then once they've done that, there's nothing they can do about it. And every time they go to a site that, is, that has warnings, a warning will come to my machine and it will tell me that somebody attempted to go onto such and such a site. So I can then ring them and just say, look, dude, I had this warning through. What's, what's, what's going on? You know, there's a real... I, oh, I can't believe we're talking about this. Do you want to know? 85% of the internet is porn. 85%. And it would not be there if people were not looking at it. And here's another, I remember Dr. Mumba telling me this, there was a survey carried out in America, done by Marriott Hotels, I think it was, or maybe Hyatt, but anyway, on a, on a Christian convention weekend, in the States, you know you go into a hotel sometimes and you can, you know, press your red button? You know what I'm saying? You know, get those films? And you know, they're so subtle in these hotels, it will only show up on your bill as room service. The consumption of adult material in the hotel at the Christian convention went up. Mm -hmm. I love what Dr. Mumma does sometimes. He'll say something like that and he'll come and hide behind the lectern. <laughs> it's true. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we won't go there for time, but it talks about fleeing. Yes. Fleeing lustful desires. Please don't ever make the mistake that that scripture only applies to teenagers. I know old age pensioners who have spent their whole life trying to flee lustful desires. And the desires seem to be quicker than them. You know, fleeing youthful lustful desires has got nothing to do with age. It's got everything to do with how serious you are. For your God and your King, can you say amen? amen. And so, you've got to be aware of your, your weak points. You know, you can read scripture and you can see people struggling with that thing. There was a man called Noah. You're a well-taught church, you've heard of Noah, haven't you? Yeah. He built an ark. He was party to one of the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. And he was the man, right, he was the man who received the call. He was the man who, who built the boat. He was the man who everybody was laughing at, but then they weren't laughing for very long. He was the only man with his family who was able to start again when they got off the boat. And then you find Noah planting his own vineyard. And before you know it, he's not only planted his own vineyard, he's farmed it, he's nurtured it, and the next thing you know, he's enjoying his vineyard. An old man. And the next thing, he's on his back. And then there's all that thing with his family. And it's got nothing to do with age. Flee youth, youthful lusts. Say to your neighbor, time to flee. Check your friends. Do they have your best interests at heart? Check where you're going. Is it good for you? Every time you leave a certain place, you have to spend the rest of the night resisting. Do you have to spend the rest of your time banishing and binding your thought life? Check what you do. Check your agenda. Check who you listen to. Check your, even check the music that you listen to. There was a song I was listening to the other day. Oh, man. I, 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 
I don't, I don't know if I can mention him, but it's a very well-known song. And it was like, and it's got a really cheery tune. <laughs> you know, you're walking down the street, <laughs> and then the song is basically a song about a rant. And he's saying, Oh, forget you. <laughs> and I'm like, Forget you. Somebody's thinking, Oh, oh. Some of you, you don't know, you just listen to things. And what you listen to and what you see, they are gateways into your soul. You've got to guard your gates. That's why if you spend all your life listening to 20 pence, <laughs> 50, 50 cents, so if I gave him 50 cents, I'd want change. Oh, I just like the beat. Oh, that bass line is just heavy. Well, that's not the only thing that's heavy. <laughs> Gotta be careful. You know, it ain't no accident that after every service here in El Shaddai, we say, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable. But it's difficult for those meditations to be acceptable if you are exposed to everything left, right, and center. Sometimes joke with the church in Bradford that one of these days we're gonna have an iPod deliverance service. Where were we? We're almost done. Number one, recognize that we have issues. Number two, seek accountability. Number three, be aware of your weak points and do something about it. There are some places you've got to, you just, for the now until you're stronger, just stop going. And if they're really your friends, they will respect the decision that you make. They may still go and they may laugh at you, but they will respect that decision. And if, you're, if, they, if they don't want to be your friend from that, well, to be honest, they ain't worth being your friend anyway. Amen. Amen. Number four. Number four. Fourth thing to do when dealing with temptation is this. And this isn't deep, but this is profound. You've got to make a choice or a decision to outlast it. I wish I could call you out into a prayer line and impart some special thing into you so that you could outlast everything. Listen, it don't work like that. We learned this morning it's through faith and patience that we possess the promise. You've got to make a decision. That whatever it takes, even if it's been years, I will not let this thing beat me. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. Yet many Christians misread that and they take that verse to be, assist the devil. <laughs> now you, you've got to resist. I love you with all my heart and I hope you love me. Yes. See, some of you are thinking about it. But listen, I love you with all my heart. I can't make those decisions for you. I want it well with you. I want your life to work. But if you continue to put yourself in places where you know it's not good for you, I can't do anything. I was talking with a lady once who had a drink problem and, and she was a certified alcoholic. She tried to come off so many times. She tried everything. I mean, she, she tried everything. And she came to me one day and she just said, well, I'm going to try this now. I'm going to try, I'm going to try. Uh, it's called self-detox. And she explained it and it sounded all, you know, there was some kind of medical theory behind it. But the moment she said self-detox, which didn't have really anybody else involved, I'm thinking, sweetheart, this ain't going to work. Because really, and this, is, this was the strategy she was saying, I'm going to wean myself off. You know, it, it used to be four bottles of wine a day and, and, and then I'm going to get down to three and then I'm going to get down to two. And listen, I was hoping that it would all going to work for her, but the, the thing is there was nobody there to stand with her. And you know what it's like. When some things have beaten you down long enough, it's as if you lose the will to fight. That's why you need somebody to stand with you. But listen, you can, have, you can have a whole company of people standing with you, but if you yourself decide, I don't want to fight, you can have a million, you can have a million Dr. Mumbers. It won't make any difference. You have got to make the decision yourself. Can you say amen? amen. Number five. We're having to do these last two very quickly because our time has gone. But, and this is a biggie. Number five. Do not let condemnation rob you of his presence if there are those times when you just fail to hit the mark or you know that you've just missed God's best please 
please do not let condemnation keep you in a place where you think you are no longer worthy. That's why 1 John 1 and 9 is there. Those times where it doesn't quite work out, you can go, at any time you can go before the Lord and you can confess your sins and he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive you just like that. And yet what is it about many Christians who think, well, surely not even I can go before God again because how long has this been an issue for? Surely I, I remember the last time I said to the Lord, this will be the last time. Lord, I'll never do that again. Lord, I'll never run my mouth off again. Lord, I'll never get emotional again and, and get in the flesh. Lord, I'll, 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 ne I'll, never, I'll never blaze up again. Lord, I'll never. And never mind remembering the time you said it would be the last time. You can remember the time before that which was the last time and the time before that which is the last time. And I just thank God that he is a God. Not only the second chance, but the third chance, the fourth chance, the tenth chance, the twentieth chance. One of the things I love about God is this. He's so good to us, even when we are not good to ourselves. Be quick to confess. Be quick to receive forgiveness. Stop beating yourself up. Likewise, when somebody needs forgiveness from you, be quick to forgive. Be quick to overlook. And so, I want to say this to you as we close. Refuse to let the devil shame you and put you in that place where you feel like you are not adequate. Every single one of us is going through some things. But this is the reality. For those of us who love God and are determined to do whatever we can to please him, yeah, there may be some blips along the way, but there will come a time when those things that maybe have been limiting you for years, you will get to the point where you know that doesn't have a hold on me anymore like it used to. It's amazing that the one man that God called a man after his own heart was a man who was a murderer. You know, he arranged for Uriah the Hittite to... He was an adulterer. And yet somehow he was a man after God's own heart. How is that possible? I'll tell you how that is possible. For all those things with David, they only happened once. And there was something about him that when he was confronted, he loved God too much to keep repeating the cycle of foolishness. I know we've all been there. You know that those times when you've missed the mark? There's something horrible about, about even going to bed at night. And you know... You know, your mind is spinning, you know. You feel so disappointed and you know. And yet all God is looking for and all God is waiting for is this. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, if you haven't, and he will, by the way, I'm ready to go again. Lord, I pick myself up on the inside. I brush myself down. I don't care what anybody else says. Lord, I love you too much to be at this point again and so my prayer for you is this as we close a bit like I prayed this morning my prayer for you is this may you find within yourself the boldness the courage to face those things head on I believe you can do it why? because we read in the scripture God will not allow you to go through some things if he did not know in the first place that you would make it through and maturity is this looking at those areas of life and refusing to grow old without tackling them, learning your lessons quick, maturing at the right speed. That is what God is looking for. And so, as I drive up the M1 today, I go home to see my family. 
Every so often I'll spare you a thought. Somebody say thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> what I want you to know I'll be thinking is this. I wonder how they're doing. I wonder how it's going for them. And you know, if I'm, when we're next down here for Dr. Dollar or, or whatever, you know, like I said, sometimes I look out and look at people and I'm saying, how are you doing? Should our paths cross in the corridors or whatever? And I say to you, ah, oh, good to see you. How are you doing? For us select few in the hall tonight, I also want you to know I'm asking, how is life? How are those areas? I don't even need to know what those areas are for you, but you know when I ask you, and you know when you think about it, you know exactly what we're talking about. Let's become a people who control our bodies, who control our thought life. Ladies, let's become a people <laughs> who control our tongue. Gentlemen, Let's become a company of men who control other things. One day we will stand before him. And I don't want to be escaping through fire. I want to present myself to him as a sacrifice worthy of his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about being perfect, but I'm talking about having a heart that yearns for his and to please him. Have you learned anything tonight? If you've learned anything tonight, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you for watching El Shaddai Bradford TV. For information on how to purchase our teaching products or to find out if there is an El Shaddai church near you, please visit our website at www.elshaddai.org.uk.